primarily. I guess the month of December we spent in Isaiah, but we're going to be in, in Joshua. We're going to be in the first chapter of Joshua this morning. And you know, I don't always you know, cling to the, the season of the year and, and you know, timely messages like that. You know, many times we're just going through uh, scripture verse by verse, but um, starting out a new year, I just really sought the Lord as to what the the most needful thing that I could share in the beginning of a new year. Um, new years are kind of like birthdays uh, in, in my in my experience. It's, it's kind of almost a, a made up thing. I mean, it does. It does uh, mark a day when you've completed another lap around the sun. But beyond that, it I means nothing earth shaking shifted from counting 2023 to 2024. I mean, it, it doesn't change anything, rolling the calendar over to another month, another day, another, those things, but, but it is an opportunity. One of the things that it is, is a, an opportunity to realize that as these things click over, as these things, as these mile markers are passed, another, like, you know, last year was another decade of marriage. When you've been married long enough, you're counting it off in decades you know, you're progressing through to a place in life that there's a limitation there. And Lord, teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts to wisdom. So it is an opportunity to mark the nature of life, the nature of time that we only get so many trips around the sun and we need to take inventory. And this is a great opportunity to do that. So in the process of that, I'm thinking about what would be the most needful thing for us as a body of believers, as us as individual believers, what could we be encouraged in that would be as needful as anything through the course of 2024? And that's what led me to the first chapter of Joshua. <clears throat> As Terry so often does, he led us into prefacing this message with the Sunday school lesson this morning that just kind of was it was perfect plowing of the ground. You know, we we went in the direction of, of talking about fear and facing fear and what fear does and how to overcome it. But what we're going to look at this morning is, is courage. And with things the way they are, and those things which are on the horizon, seen and unseen, we as God's people are to be a people of courage. And not just courage to endure. You know, you, I've said this so many times, many of you probably even know what's coming, but, but there, there are some hymns, and I'm not even sure if it's in our hymn book or not. There are some hymns that I just cannot stand. And one of them is hold the fort, hold the fort. <laughs> we are not in a position to be holding the fort, um, the increase, we spent a month on this, remember, just last month. The increase of his government and peace, there is no end. The kingdom of God is advancing. This is not something where we've just got to cling together in a small huddle and make sure that we endure to the end so that we can be saved. The, the church that Jesus is building is one that the gates of hell will not prevail against. So that's the backdrop for what I want to read this morning. I just want to read the first nine verses of Joshua chapter one. 
spending most of our time there from verse 6 on. It says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and to, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses. I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of a good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to you your fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, and do not <clears throat> that, or that you may prosper wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night <clears throat> that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. <clears throat> For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That, that first portion there, uh, I, I'll touch it, but we'll not spend a lot of time there. But what it does is it, it declares, it defines their part and God's part. God had made great and precious promises to the children of Israel. He has made exceedingly great and precious promises to us, his New Testament people. We have promises from God that pertain to salvation. We have promises from God that pertain to peace. We have promises from God that, that pertain to literally every area of life. God's will is declared clearly in his word his, his promises are steadfast and true. And there is a, a component of this that is a living interaction between God and his people. We, we look here and we see that God was giving this people a land. He had promised it to their fathers. Abraham, and then it passed on to Isaac and to Jacob, and then Jacob's sons spent 400 plus years in Egypt. Now they're coming into the land. They've been led out of the land with a strong hand, passing through the Red Sea, being sustained in the wilderness after their unbelief. That generation fell in the wilderness. Now another generation comes on, and they're going into the promised land. They're going to possess the promise that had been made to them. The promises of God, of God are yes and amen, for sure. But they require, many require an interaction between God and man. These, these are the covenant promises of God. God promises to do, God promised to give them this land. Was it going to happen? Yes. Was it going to happen for those who dwelt in unbelief. Well, that whole generation died in the wilderness to prove that it was not going to happen to those who would not interact with God by faith. So we look at these, we, we see that God has promised to give them an inheritance. 
It was going to be theirs. We possess great and precious promises. They are ours. They are ours. The fruit of those things are ours. But what lay before these people on this day when God is taking Joshua aside and giving him very strict instruction to be courageous. To be courageous. He says, be strong and very courageous. Be strong and have a good courage. A good courage is a courage that's willing to step out and do that which is necessary to possess that which is promised. This is what they're, they're have in front of them. They, they've crossed supernaturally across the Red Sea into a wilderness. They've been supernaturally sustained in this wilderness. Now they're going to supernaturally cross the Jordan River at flood stage to enter in to a promised land. Are the inhabitants of the land just going to run scared from before them? Not a chance. Not a chance. They're, they're going to go through a process of possessing the land that the Lord was giving them. Much has been promised to us and much is given to us, but it must be possessed and it takes strength and it takes courage and these you don't have and I don't have we, we, we are not in possession of these things in our own strength we do not possess that which is necessary we don't even have the faith to be able you know these things are, are received by faith we don't have the faith the faith itself is a gift from God the faith itself is the the ability to trust him those things are imparted to us by God, through his word, by his spirit. It is a supernatural work of God, but we are active participants in the very same way that they had to cross that Jordan River. The waters heaped up, the waters stood up in a pile, basically, and it took courage to step out in front of that because it was only the hand of God that withheld that flooding river to allow them to go across on dry land. They, I mean, it should give you strength and courage whenever you see that which cannot happen happening. When you see the waters piled up and a way has been made where there seemed to be no way, but it still takes strength and courage to walk forward and possess that which is ours. Let's, let's look specifically at, at these, this, these four verses at the end, and I will do my best to be somewhat brief. The courage to receive the promises says, be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance, the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. It took courage to step upon that which was promised. Because this, what had, what had stood in their way 40 years earlier? They'd sent the spies into the land. There had been people who had gone there and seen what it was like. They, they brought back bunches of grapes that it took two men to carry them on a pole. I don't even have a grid for that. I, 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 it's unimaginable to me that there could be something that fruitful, but they brought back the evidence of it. It was a fruitful land. It was a place to be desired. There was, there was much there that was, that was going to be fulfilling to them, but there were giants in the land. There, there was that that had to be defeated. And, and what kept them out for those 40 years? We were as grasshoppers. Not in their sight, but we were as grasshoppers in our own sight. That they seen themselves as just puny and small and, and that which could not stand against such giant enemies 
there, I'm not sure who you look around the world and, and, and define as your enemies, but you have no enemies that can defeat you. You have no enemies that cannot be stood against. There's no enemy that can harm you. Now, I'm satisfied. And part of the reason I chose the words that I did there is because of the immediate objections that come up out of the human heart that says, well, there's people out there that would love to kill me as a believer. You know, there, there are, are certain sects of, of different religions who feel like it's God's work for them to kill people like us. And we think, well, they could kill it. How, how can you say they can't harm us? The harm that we're talking about is, I mean, can somebody make me feel pain? Yes. Can somebody make me hurt? Yes. Can somebody kill me? Yes. But they don't kill the real me. The real me lives on. The, the real eternal life for, for all of us that are in Christ, eternal life has already started. We, we have eternal life dwelling within us. He who lives and believes in me shall never die, the Lord says. We can walk in this. We, we can walk fearlessly. We can walk substantially. We can accomplish that which God has given us to do. And that's the primary thing that I'm looking at this morning. We can go a thousand different directions at this point with the message. What has God promised us? God has promised us that he has works before ordained that we would walk, walk in them. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has before ordained that we would walk in them. You have a work. It is the promise of God that you have a work. You have a very specific work. It is that which resides before you. I'm not saying to spend the next year of your life trying to figure out what God's will is. I'm saying just go from this place today and do God's will as it presents itself moment by moment, day by day, do his will and you will have accomplished that which he has before ordained that you would walk in those good works. Don't, don't bypass good works that are available to you looking for that one that is yours. If it's available to you, you have the capacity in Christ to accomplish it, put your hand to it because you will not get that day back. That opportunity will pass. You may be able to do it another day, but it will not come back. And that, that moment will have passed. Be courageous what courage allows somebody to do that the, that the weak-hearted will not do is to act without hesitation. This has probably been one of the greatest weaknesses of, of my life is I'm, I'm of an analytical mind. I, I may even know specifically what what needs to happen, but I will pause to figure out why it needs to happen that way. And sometimes those opportunities to act have passed me by while I was trying to analyze the, the situation. It's called the paralysis of analysis. We, we don't need to be, we need to be there at set on hair trigger, ready to go off for God in any opportunity that is given to us. He has before ordained for certain things to be accomplished by every one of us. Now, I've also seen what I mentioned just a moment ago, that this paralyzation of the big thing. God, there, there's this God-sized task out there that I know he, we got to we got to dream big. We got to shoot for the moon. We got to do the big thing. We got to grow the huge church. We got to we got to do the whatever you fill in the blank. But it's this big thing that has to happen. Big things 
can happen and big things will happen, but they'll happen the way, same way that small things happen. And God does nothing small. It, it takes the same power for you to obey him, speaking to your neighbor across the street, taking uh, so, some needed food to somebody who, who is in need, you take that to them. It takes the same power there that it does to raise the dead. One gets you a lot more acclaim than the other one will, but what is God's will in the moment? What has God before ordained that you would do in that moment? And that we dare not pass by the opportunity to do the good that's at hand looking to accomplish the big, notorious thing, the, the thing that will bring attention. We want to glorify God, and, and great big things are awesome to happen, but the vast majority of people do small things. The vast majority of do things do things of, of small consequence but massive impact. It's a small thing to speak the gospel to somebody who has never heard it explained with clarity that they don't know why they're the way that they are now. And they don't know that there's a way out to, to, to a place where they can dwell in peace and rest in God. They don't know that. And if you have that knowledge and you share that with them, that's not a big deal to do. Especially if you're filled with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and created the whole universe, it's not a big thing to do. But the consequences of that can be eternal. We are doing things that make eternal difference in the lives of others. We have that opportunity before us every day. When we've encouraged a discouraged believer, when we have strengthened the, the, the weak among us, when we have confronted the proud among us, when we've done any of those things that, that we've talked of recently, when we do those things when we put our hand to his work as he presents it before us, remember what I spoke from second chapter. Wow, I was drawing a blank there. Second chapter of Ephesians where it talks about that he has before ordained that we would walk in those good works. If he has before ordained that we would walk in them, he can guide our path to them. You, you don't have to go and, and, and find out six months, six years ahead of time what you need to be doing. I mean, some of what we need to do for in the Lord's service requires planning. It requires organization. It, it requires a lot of things like that. But the vast majority of what we will do day by day is that which open doors open before us and we accomplish that, which is ours to do. Well, that doesn't sound a whole lot like going in and possessing the land of Israel, which is what the, the people of Israel were compelled to do in that moment. They were only being instructed to go forward and take that which was promised to them by God. That's the principle that's here. That's the principle that applies to all people at all times. When what God has promised needs to be pursued. When God opens the door, people need to move towards it. When God opens the, the, the promises to us, we need to do what it takes to possess the land. I'm not going to rehearse the whole story of, of Jericho and then... AI or I, whatever that little two letter word place is where they fell on their face and then the restoration there. There was all sorts of things that occurred, but they took it a little at a time. They would go one step forward, sometimes a full step back, two steps forward, 
They would move, but they were constantly moving forward. Strength and courage accomplishes that. Look at verse seven. It says, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. The word of God. Amanda was encouraging us to, to join together you know, with their group to read through scripture systematically to soak ourselves in scripture. If, if, you, if you have a desire to be strong and very courageous, if you have a desire to know the will of God, if you have a desire to know the things that have been promised to you and to receive the faith to possess those things and to walk in the ways of your God so as to find yourself at the end of the journey greeted by a well done, good and faithful servant, this is the desire of your heart. The word is the place you need to be. You need to meditate upon his word day and night. You, you need to read his word regularly and think upon it continually. I mean, after 30 some years now of walking with the Lord and being exposed to much truth many years leading up to that, all of those things combined, I think biblically. Whenever something confronts me, the response of my mind is scripture. The vast majority of the time, it, it will be either a principle from scripture or it will be scripture specifically that is there. We have a great and precious promise that we have Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside. He is with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. And it is his job to lead us into all truth. It is his job to bring to our remembrance anything that Christ has told us. So there you are. Why would you want to spend time night and day meditating upon the word of the Lord to get that word in you so it's available for Holy Spirit to bring up whenever it's applicable? He's not speaking, his primary mode of speech to us is not spontaneous in the moment. It is to recall that which he's already told us. It's either to interpret it, to apply in a situation and bring it up so that we can speak it into a situation, into somebody's life. Whatever the case may be, we know that we are compelled to be a people who are voraciously receiving his word. We read it, we study it, and yes, there is a difference. But there's a, there's a place for both of those. We, we need the big picture of reading large swaths of it at a time. And we also need to go deep into a phrase or into a, a verse or a small passage. We, we need both of those. We need that day and night meditation upon the word. So this book of the law will not depart from out of your mouth, but you shall meditate upon it night and day that you may observe all, oops, already went there. Let's go to, or no, I, I hadn't read that one second time. It says, but you shall meditate on it night and day that you may observe according to, to do according as it is written, for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. It takes courage to follow the map. This right here, this, this word of God is the map. It shows us the, if you pay attention to it, you will see there, there will be, it's not in the text, but it'll be there blinking on the page. You are here. You are here. 
Like, when you read something and it, and it cuts you to the heart, you are here. You need to be here. And then here's the path to get from where you are to where you ought to be. This is what good success defined by kingdom terms is to actually possess what's been promised. To do so, to do so, you find where you're here, you find where you should be, and you take the prescribed path to get from that place to the other. And it's a process. It's something that God is imparting to us day by day and that we are walking out as we walk with him. And then that last verse, have I not commanded you? And this is probably the thing I, I desire to say most forcefully among everything that I say this morning. This is not optional. Have, he repeats it to them, lest they think he is letting them off the hook as this is a, a mighty suggestion. You would be crazy not to go this way. No, he says, have I not commanded you? Have I not given you this as an imperative that you be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid or dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You talk about great and precious promises. The Lord is with you wherever you go. If you take a detour into sin, does the Lord leave you? He's with you wherever you go even when you are where you should not be, he is there. He is there. You, you've taken him with you wherever you go. And the great and precious promises of God is that he's going to take you to where only he can take you. He goes with you wherever you go. One of my, um, the, the greatest hits of the promises of God it is in Romans where it says that I'll just take, I'll make it personal for me. You should do the same thing for you. God has predestined me to be conformed to the image of his son. I will be just like Jesus. If I drag him off into the mud, he pulls me back onto the right he pulls me back onto the straight and the narrow way. If I step off into thorns, I get all scratched up, but he heals me and he brings me back and he puts me on the straight and the narrow way. He has done, it, it is his promise. It is a destiny determined beforehand. It is not in question whether I will be like Jesus. How much like Jesus will I be? I will be just like you. I will have his character. And the same thing is true of you. That's a destiny that he has not only put out before you as a great and precious promise, but he is accomplishing that. And everything that you experience is leading you towards that conformity, being conformed to the image of his son. Being conformed is, it's like Plato. I remember as a kid having, having Play-Doh and I mean, one of the easiest things you can do with Play-Doh is just get a small handful of it and just squeeze it. And then when you turn it loose, what is it? It, it is conformed to the shape. It has all your palm prints. It shows every crease. It shows the insides of your knuckles, the, your fingerprints. Everything is upon it. Being conformed to the image of his son is just this. It is there is Christ, the image of the invisible God, Jesus himself, and he is the mold. He is the mold and we are in him. Our life is hidden with God in Christ. And then pressure is placed upon us. 
All the pressures of life are working to press him, pre press us into his image. Don't waste your pain. Don't, don't waste your uh, failures. I, I've grown far more in my failures than I have in my successes. I thank God success is a far easier way to live life. Don't get me wrong. But your failures are God's blessing to show you where your weakness is and where you've yet, where, where, where the hardness of, of the material he's working with still is not yielding to the pressure that would conform us to his image. That's what he's doing. And I'm not, I'm not here trying to persuade you that that is what he is doing. I am here to tell you without any fear of contradiction, this is what he's doing. Whether you know it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you think I've gone off on a tangent or not, this is what he has declared and this is what he is doing. Be of good courage. He's taking you someplace you want to be. You may not enjoy the path to get there, but you want to be there. You, you want this more than anything that, that you could possibly desire. Be of good courage. Um, as a good work colleague of mine says regularly, he hadn't said it yet to me about 2024, but I'm sure he will as soon as I talk to him. He's an Austrian guy. He will say, well, Tracy, at least it will not be boring. That I fear, have no fear of, 2024 will not be boring. I have no idea what's over the horizon, what you will face, what I will face, how much tragedy and how much glory and how much blessing are all going to pour through all of our lives individually and collectively but I know that he is with us I know that he desires to prosper us in our way in every way that's meaningful of a eternal nature now, it may not be blessings in dollars and cents but it will be blessing prosperity in the ways that truly matter are a promise from God I've got to tie this in with what I've been preaching for the last several months. Matthew 28, 20, last half of it says, And lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way that it speaks to our heart and that it gives us the direction, Lord. It gives us the the groundedness that we need to, to move forward from where we are to the destiny that you have, have chosen to reveal in us, God. We ask you now, Lord, as we turn our attention to the table, Lord, that you will just cause our hearts to, to rejoice in you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And we do have the elements of uh, communion before us this morning, first opportunity to, to take communion together here at the beginning of, of this year for all of our